Hello. Welcome to the second episode in the lecture series devoted to the novels Janet Winterson's The Passion and Toni Morrison A Mercy. In the previous session, I spoke briefly about some analogies and differences between the narratives in part one and part two. Both parts reveal significant details about the lives and social circumstances of two major characters, Henri and Villeneuve. Both characters are young and have a great appetite for life. Both come from poor backgrounds and experience difficulties in finding a sense of orientation. Both are fascinated with two charismatic figures, Napoleon and Queen of Spades, who um, become the center of their attention and sustained love. Both, in other words, seem to be confused about the mystery of life, that which is most exciting and worth pursuing. This joie de vivre, as the French say, is imbued with bewilderment and confusion caused by the ongoing social and political circumstances of the war, the Napoleonic Wars. But there are also important distinctions we need to emphasize. Only, let us remember, hails from a conservative and rather provincial milieu. His exceeding naivety becomes an object of ridicule among his friends and superiors. Napoleon takes a liking to him primarily because he looks so docile, so innocent, and so unthreatening. Villanelle, on the other hand, is raised in a rich and refined urban setting and has the polished manners, thoughts, and spirit of a Venetian lady. She knows her flaws and contrives to hide them. She even transgresses the codes that frame her as a docile female subject in her society and strives to counter the sexual disempowerment by concealing her identity, her identity behind uh, masculine apparel. She takes a particular pleasure in wearing men's clothes and infiltrating into exclusively masculine spaces or practicing masculine uh, activities, such as rowing a boat. She is marked out as an aberration uh, in her society. She has whipped feet, which is what distinguishes Venetian men. Unlike only, she is a slippery figure. She learns how to conceal her real identity and live in multiple guises. The casino becomes a second home where she unleashes her keen desire to discover and explore new types of freedom and passion. Notably, the passion of gain and loss I referred to in the previous session. But in the casino, she becomes also vulnerable to other individuals of even wilder passions. The Queen of Spades is an in inhibited woman who takes a fancy to Villanelle, seduces her sexually, and entraps her into a hide-and-seek game. She's a sort of femme fatale that, by her physical charm and suaveness, turns her admirer into a helpless subject. Villanelle's rendezvous with the Queen of Spades transform her into a passionate woman. Her life is punctuated by the prospects of eventual meetings. By the end of the narrative, however, this liaison comes abruptly to an end when the Queen of Spades' husband arrives from his trip, leaving Villanelle literally stranded and heartbroken. Up to this point, Henri's and Villeneuve's narrative seem to have little in common, except that they are set in the same, in the same period. They are vistas of life, if you want, during the same age. Now, this bifurcated narrative 
um, structure allows us to see how itineraries are shaped by sheer accidents and how men, men's destinies become intertwined in a casual and arbitrary way. One more important thing to note about Henri and Vellanil is the location of their historical narratives. The historical setting is revealing and one has little trouble to connect the context of the novel with the timeline of Napoleonic Wars, especially the year 1804, which is the kind of setting we have in both parts, part one and two. But the vantage point from which the events are narrated and the placement at the center of fictitious characters like Henri and Villeneuve offers a great deal of empowerment for the author Winterson to shun the charter terrains of European historiography and furnish a sub-narrative, a subtext of this era. In this sense, the Passion offers a different vision of the Napoleonic era that one does not come across in the mainstream narratives of learned scholars and historians. In another lecture, I will address the affiliation between history and fiction, both in the Passion and in Toni Morrison's A Mercy. What I want to emphasize here is the dramatic effect that, that is generated when novelists like Winterson place uh, marginal and rather imaginary characters alongside historically defined uh, figures like Napoleon. One cannot but note the spillover um, that occurs when um, fictional and historical subjects are brought together in the mutual influence they cast on one another. In the rest of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about the cook. We first encounter the cook as a servant in Napoleon's kitchen. He is described as a big guy weighing 200 pounds, vulgar and extremely mean. His um, first encounter with Henri reveals the repulsive demeanor of his character and the patronizing attitude he has vis-a-vis -vis his fellow workmates and soldiers. The next scene takes place in a brothel. The cook's sexual fantasies, his aggressive act and abusive words clearly show his misogynic sentiment. His contemptuous behavior towards women or the women in the brothel is a recurrent motive in the novel. Much later, we see him how he seeks to turn Villanelle into his sixth slave and even barter her for cash money. In the, um, the first narrative, we see how he follows a life of debauchery and indulges himself in excessive drinking and frequent um, visits to the brothels. When Napoleon makes his visit to the kitchen, the cook is in a state of stupor and is dismissed from his job. Henri is appointed his substitute as um, described on pages 1819 of my edition. Um, the quote uh, on, on, on these pages is, I think, very revealing. Um, Henri, the voice of Henri, says, this was more perfect than any ordinary miracle. Uh, I had been chosen, chosen to replace the cook. I had been chosen. I didn't foresee the cook would become my sworn in me. And that's an early indication of, you know, the, the kind of relationship that would evolve, relationship of animosity and hatred um, between the cook and Henri, between the cook and Villanelle, obviously. Another interesting uh, passage on page 19, uh, 19 reveals even further details uh, on the cook. The cook, it stated, who sobered up with a thumbing head in a worse and in a worse temper than usual after he had been constrained, couldn't step outside without some soldier winking and poking at him. Finally, he came to where I sat, said Henri, with my little Bible and grabbed me 
clothes by the collar. You think you're safe because Bonaparte wants you? You are safe now, but there are years ahead. He pushed me back against the onion sack and spat in my face. It was a long time before we met again because the captain had him transferred to the store outside Boulogne. End of quote. In part two, we first encountered a cook in the casino as a gambler. On page 55, there is an elaborate description of him offered to us from the perspective of Villeneuve. Quote, He's a large man with pads of flesh on his palms like Baker's Dow. He has fans. He must have. He spends in a moment what I earn in a month. He's cunning, though, for all his madness at the table. End of quote. The cook now, the rich gambler, takes a keen interest in Villanelle. He's intrigued by her camouflage and has a design to strip her off her guise and possess her. We see in part three how this relationship evolves in a dramatic way that it will impact the life of Villanelle and Henri. Villanelle knows little about his mean background or about what he did to acquire his fortune. That will be revealed to us in the next part. It is clear, however, that his contempt for women, his repulsive manners and sexual depravity make him the absolute villain, villain in the novel. Here are a few questions to reflect on in the meantime. In what way does the first two parts of the narrative prepare the reader for what comes later? in part three and part four. Next question. How can we qualify the narration, the narration or storytelling in parts one and two? What can you say about them? In terms of structure, in terms of narrators, in terms of time sequence, etc. Last question. What makes the passion, the novel, the passion, a postmodern novel in your opinion?